Good evening, everyone out there in the uh, Zoom world and, and YouTube land. Uh, we'd like to open up this Northampton Planning Board meeting for Thursday, April 28th, um, 2022. Our agenda is fairly light. We're going to look at our summer schedule, um, the Planning Board bylaws, and uh, I think we have an A&R and some yeah. ministry view, and then some short discussion kind of planning items. So without further ado, Carolyn, do you wanna start with your things? Um, sure, uh, let's see, do you wanna do the, um, so I sent out the bylaws that are, um, and, and the way this works is this is, these are just sort of minor updates from five or six years ago when they were last reviewed. Um, nothing substantial has changed, but the way they're written is they get presented at one meeting and then the next meeting you officially vote to adopt them. And then what we'll do is we'll post them um, on the web. And so there are documents that, um, let me just pull this up. There are poor, so this is covers all the boards and there are sections that are common to sort of holding public hearings um, for the boards. And then there are other unique ones to individual boards. So for example, the planning boards associate members have different, um, allowances than some of the other associate members like the zoning board of appeals associate members have different roles from the planning board. Um, so that's identified in, in this document. Um, let me just pull this up. I don't know why it's not on my screen. I thought I had it on the black back here. Um, so one second. Oh my goodness. Um, okay. Um, so I don't know if anybody's had a chance to um, review these. Um, the shared section, as I mentioned, sort of covers um, all the bodies. So talking about sort of appointing authority, the applications, the records will be held in our office procedures for adopting and amending um, these, this set of rules, um, just the standard notice procedures for public hearings, the conduct of public hearings. And it, frankly, this is also um, referenced in the FAQ page that we set up that this um, on our website after a couple of meetings ago, I, the comment had come up, I think from the public about how people didn't understand what the process was. Um, for permits and the review. And um, you all had asked that we create a page, you know, a simple uh, page where uh, the public can go to understand what the permit review process is and how hearings are conducted. So we've had these bylaws, in, you know, buried in the web pages um, for a number of years. What we did at that point was pull out um, after that meeting, we pulled out even sort of the public hearing process and um, streamlined it and then created links to some of these documents. And this being one of them will be linked to that FAQ page if people want to find out more about each of the boards and sort of how how they function, this, can, this will be linked to there. Um, and so it talks about quorums and public participation um, and how members are appointed and if there are subcommittees, the role of the chair and the vice chair, um, signatures, especially as it relates, this relates more to conservation commission and planning board than it does for some of the other boards. Um, and then there are specific um, then the next section two is specifically about planning board. So in particular, um, sort of the, the cycle of 
um, um, appointing or voting on chair and vice chair, and then the duties of the associate members. Um, and then it goes on to sec section three is for the zoning board and then there are subsequent sections. And I noticed actually the one that I sent out um, didn't have anything for the conservation commission or historical commission. So I have to just make sure that those are all plugged into the same, this, this um, document. Um, but anyway, does anybody have questions about this? Okay. No. So, so then I'll put it on as an agenda item for voting to ratify or adopt at the next meeting. And then once that happens, I'll link it into that FAQ page related to permits on, on our website so that anybody can, you know, go look for it there. Remind me again, Carolyn, how often do we look at this and adopt it? Once every Yes. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if something changes, like things don't change that much, but if there's a need, if the board wants to change, you know, the way it does business or um, things that just aren't working, then we can open it up. But there's no set requirement. Right. It just says that our charter just says the board shall adopt rules for conduct basically um, and, and it's not any more specific than that right and there's nothing embedded in here about zoom meetings face-to-face -face versus virtual meetings that's all kind of a separate emergency procedures almost right right and i don't i have seen and you all may have seen as well that there are some people have stated an interest to allow this to go forward beyond emergency measures. And so that would take an act of the legislature to allow remote participation for meetings, because right now we're just operating under emergency procedures. That's why it's not really in here yet, because it's not a long-term um, grant of, um, uh, you know, it's not been granted for cities and towns to do it that way. So. Um, and just because this touches on like the composition of the board and the terms and things like that, um, I just want to mention, I'm sure everybody saw that little notice that the uh, sub special select committee of the city council and other people are looking at how do we engage more people in the community to join committees like the planning board or the conscom and try to diversify our board. I don't, I don't know if anybody raise their hand to volunteer to be part of that select group. But I think you have until tomorrow at midnight to uh, put your papers in, in case you had some free time and you wanted to help inform how to get more people involved in the city, city commissions and volunteer boards, so. Or if you know other people that would have an interest, they yeah. have until that they, cut they, off. Yeah. <laughs> In case someone wanted to stay up really late and then press send. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Yep. Um, and then the next item, you can do the a and R if you'd like. Um, sure. That's pretty quick. It's actually not a division of land, and we don't necessarily require this to happen. I mean, to, to for them to do it this way, but the surveyor, where did it go? Um, oh, hold on. Um, the surveyor wanted to do this just as a um, to make sure that um, it was done both through the deed and the lot layout. Um, so can you see my screen here? I'll zoom in. This is on Northern Avenue and there are four parcels here that are all owned by the same property owner and they really just want to create one deed that pulls all of them together into one parcel and so it's not instead of breaking apart a parcel it's really pulling things together so they're not creating any new building lots and it's not um, a subdivision so um, it came in as an approval not required 
so I would just need a, a, a vote to have this plan endorsed. I vote to endorse the NR Northern Avenue. I second. Is that Chris? I, second. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Great. So the, <laughs> the motion to approve has been made and seconded. Any discussion about this A and R? All right. Hearing none, we'll go to that uh, voice vote on Zoom. Um, how about if we start with Corinne? Can I vote on these? Um, actually, no, you can't vote on any Ah, thank you, Corinne. Uh, Chris? Yes. And uh, Ms. Taylor, Sam? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And Krista? Yes. And I'll vote yes also. Okay. Um, so do you want to do summer schedule? Sure. Or zoning discussion? Let's do summer schedule. Um, you Is all summer may schedule remember. in person? Well, we are starting May 12th, um, which is the okay. next meeting in person. Um, and, um, the, typically you've met once per month in July and August, either the second Thursday or the fourth Thursday. So this is to sort of figure out that schedule. Um, I also just, um, as an FYI, I have a conflict for the second meeting in June. So depending on whether we get any permits, I mean, I might push permits off from that last June meeting. So you may not have a second meeting in June either, but for July and August, at least that's sort of been the traditional, those are the months where you drop down from two meetings per month to one meeting per month. Um, and so I don't know if you guys are prepared with your calendars or you know yet what will work best for each of you so that we can at least have a quorum. I didn't, I knew David wasn't coming tonight, but I forgot to ask him if he had any particular um, preference. Now I will say we technically can meet via Zoom until July 15th. That's when the governor extended the provision, the emergency provision to meet remotely. Um, so if that's better for July, then I would say we could meet remotely July 14th and that could be the meeting then if that works better for people. I know I, I wanted to start meeting in person again, um, but you know, if, it, if we can't get a quorum because everybody's schedules are opposite each other, then, you know, we can obviously work it out for July. I have no idea if that's going to be an allowance after July 15th. Sam, do you want to revisit this notion of meeting in person as soon as the first meeting in May? <clears throat> How are you feeling these days? Oh, I'm feeling fine. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I will just wear a mask. I'm okay. Perfectly okay. okay. <clears throat> and we can have, I'm definitely planning on having the windows in council chamber open. You know, though there's plenty of cross breeze when you get those, um, both sides of those windows open. So we're going to take that measure as well. And Carolyn and I talked about it a little bit because it is going to be a change for a lot of the public who's been really coming to all kinds of meetings, you know, not only the planning board, but city council, conservation commission. Um, so I think we're gonna to try to do a little bit extra outreach to let people know there will be, uh, Carolyn, uh, Zoom kind of only uh, a viewing ability of yeah. the meeting and the discussion, but not participation via Zoom, as I understand it. Right. So it'll be like the city council meetings were before COVID, where you could turn on the cable new, you know, channel and watch city council meetings. Um, and but we'll just be doing it via Zoom. Are so we doing are we requiring? Are we requiring masks? Like if 
it gets really crowded? We can't do that because there's no, there's no provision. There are no rules anymore. Everything's been lifted. So we can't unilaterally say, um, you know, for this meeting, we're requiring that. Okay. Chris, you had a question? Room 16 in City Hall, is that where we meet? City Council Chamber. So, um, oh my gosh, have you only been on Zoom? <laughs> Corinne, too. I only went to one in person. Wow. I Just don't take my seat. It'll be so fun for you folks. I sit on the right. Okay. <laughs> So the municipal building, if you're if your back is to the city hall and you're facing the municipal building, you go in the door for your municipal building and turn right, and that's city council chambers. So it's right off if you go into that back parking lot behind city hall, you go in that entrance. And into city hall. Um, what's that? It's in city hall. No, nope. it's in the in building. The small behind, building behind city hall. Yes. Where it's, you pay it's your where you go to like pay ticket. your taxes. Yeah. Taxes where pay, and tickets. Where I pay my wife's parking tickets. There. Yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So you go in the same door you go to pay parking tickets, but just keep going. Don't turn left. Just go straight and then turn right. Okay. And that's city council chambers. And right, it's it's pretty roomy. There's a bathroom and a water bubbler there. You can't bring in Joe's pizza, though, or any takeout containers and be eating on camera in city council. People have been known to sneak in a uh, iced tea or a coffee, but uh, eating is frowned on. Um, Carolyn, in terms of that summer schedule, I wonder if maybe we could do a doodle poll and send it out and we could harass people to respond to it. Okay. Um, and then we could really lay out our people would have a chance to look at their personal calendars and vote okay. yay or nay about. Yeah. Everybody. I do love it. I do love the idea of um, being able to switch to Zoom for the July. Mainly because I like to be on the beach. <laughs> And anyone can join. You can come on the beach. Come to the beach. Enjoy. There's another room for you. <laughs> uh, right. Well, I'll send out the doodle poll. That's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. I also will say, I think that probably the remote meetings will be extended again. Past July. But under emergency order or because the last I heard was the governor was saying it has to be legislation. Yeah, it'll be some it'll be something. We usually like have been throwing it into budgets or something like that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Good. So do the poll. Thanks. So then there's uh the next items are really I, I've been thinking about some of our our hearings and public discussions over the past six months, some of our applications and some of the real contentious issues that have come up, um, you know, not only just what I've read in letters to the Gazette, but what I've heard from folks. And I think some of the discussion we've had in our meetings, um, some of, you know, to, around specifics, some, the, the William Street thing about that tree, did it really have to come down? Was there any way to, and I think Carolyn, we can talk about specific examples now because the issues have been voted on and passed, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. it's closed. So the uh, <clears throat> whether there was enough open space there, was the open space actually open space or is it really illusionary? Illus illusionary. Um, what about that tree? Or was the only really nice tree on that lot? Was there any way to save it? Um, so uh, then we've also been talking about kind of uh, some of the application that came before us. There was quite a bit of discussion around the lighting standards, how we handle that um how we uh, uh not push back but how we negotiate or how we how i understand the lighting standards not being an expert at all 
Uh, the same thing with the Arborist report. I'm not an expert, you know, I rely on the DPW to help with the storm water and all of those utility calculations. But some of the other things we as volunteers are asked to really cast a professional eye on it. I mean, Carolyn and Wayne do that prior to the application reaching us, but we're still asked um, during the meetings to be able to kind of talk about those things intelligently. <laughs> and it's hard for me sometimes to be quite honest. Um, and also there's, uh, uh, let's see, so these three things that I've mentioned, one is the open space calculations, how they happen. And really when we have a large infill project downtown and the, the applicant tells us, yes, I have 10% or 30% of open space, we often can't see that. And the open space may just be for gardens or a little piece over here for snow storage, but there's no real place for people, residents of any kind of complex to kind of sit around a picnic table or to have their own community garden. And uh, so I, I, I would love to be able to have a time where we could have a conversation about that. Um, what is that open space all about? Is it really for people to enjoy some of the outside in their, uh, of their residential units, or is it really just about planting? Um, things of that nature. And also we've asked, I think the developers to give us some kind of rationale behind their calculations that often we can't quite understand how they get to this 20% or 30%. So that's one item. And so really what I'm doing is I'm opening this up to a little bit of discussion, but really trying to figure out when and where if we can talk about it a little bit more and maybe get some input from people outside of our board who may know some more about these things. Um, the other one is our, our tree standards. Um, there's a, a group in the city called the Urban Forestry Commission. Some of you may know of them. It's a volunteer board along with Rich Parasoletti, who's the tree warden. They spend a lot of time um, thinking about researching our tree canopy and the impact it has on our city and the planet. We've, there's, we have a tree ordinance that we use more or less pretty successfully when developers are asked to um, calculate the amount of trees on a given parcel of land. And if they remove them, how much they have to put back into the tree um, pot, so to speak, or what they have to plan on site. Um, but I think some of that is being questioned by experts now. And I think the tree and Carolyn has had some of these conversations. Um, I, I, and I've often wondered myself about how that works. You know, we lose these major significant trees, especially downtown where we don't have a lot. And then we just plant these little, little saplings um, that take forever and a day to grow. Um, and of course, what we hear from developers is, we have to remove that significant tree because of the footprint on my building, the size of my lot, uh, the need for me to run that formula to make sure that I make a, a, you know, a living profit and still provide uh, residences for the city. So all of these items have a, a, a pro and a con to it, I know, especially around providing a lot of housing, new housing downtown. And but that what's the impact on some of these other um, concrete items and really values too that we hold important in the city. Um, so that's one of them. And so again, is, is there a place where the board be willing if we ever had a quiet day to have some of the representatives from the Urban Tree Commission come and talk to us just about the things that they have researched and the things that they've discussed and where they see kind of the future of trees in the city. Um, for me, I know that would be really helpful background to have. Um, and the last one is uh, the, uh, the lighting standards. We've talked a little bit about maybe taking a field trip with a light meter to see exactly what the, um, the lighting is. And again, the, uh, when I look at an application package, a lighting engineer has gone through it and he, and he or she has all these rationales and provides these, um, this hardware and lighting equipment to give a certain amount of light for that and for that location. Um, 
So I have no ground really to say maybe that's too much or it's the wrong color light. I think we've been helped a little bit by certainly Carolyn and, and a little bit by David, uh, who as an architect spent some more time on it. And Chris, I don't know if you do in your work with Bay State, um, you probably have a lot more knowledge than I do. Um, but I yeah, know it. I mean, I've created <clears throat> photometric plans for about 15 years. As yeah. Yep. Yeah. So then we could learn a lot from you on a trip like that, perhaps. There's another group in Northampton uh, called, oof, I want to say Bright Lights Northampton or Low Lights Northampton. Carolyn has met them. Um, some of you have probably met a fellow by the name of James Lowenthal, who's a big advocate of the dark skies. Um, and uh, Corinne, I see you smiling. You've perhaps met him in an advocacy role. Um, but there is a lot to be said about the way development happens and how we are expecting um, there's a, a baseline of light that our ordinances, again, we have a lighting ordinance that's been passed by the city council that we have to stick by when we look at plans. But that lighting ordinance, I'm not sure when it was passed and is it still uh, relevant for the kinds of lights we have now and the kinds of expectations of the residents of the city. Um, one of the big things for this group is, you know, uh, it, it, there are three things that impacts the wildlife at night, for sure, of the brighter skies. Um, there's a piece around the warming of the planet because of the lights going on. And there's also a piece about just not being able to appreciate the, uh, the night sky and the stars that are there. Um, so, uh, again, that's just an area where I was thinking if we had some time on our agenda some night, we could hear some of some other folks who have done research in this area and get an idea of what they're looking at and what makes them so, um, so passionate about these ideas. Um, I don't want to, we don't want to radicalize the planning board for sure, but Northampton is certainly known for um, being kind of out in front of a lot of issues like this, whether it's coming, whether it's about infill or bicycling infrastructure or pedestrian. Um, so I think it's, it really behooves us to look at some of these other areas like tree canopy, lighting, um, open space standards, things of that nature. What's the, what's the final goal on that though? Because we're still applying ordinances that are in place. So what is, this background going to do for us? Are we are we recommending changes to these ordinances as a board? Well, that's a good question, Chris. And I think if we had some kind of forum where we talked about it, I think city councilors and the public would come perhaps. And maybe it's not something that the planning board hosts, but there's something that we support. But I think, yeah, I think many of these ordinances now have been in place for a while. And we always want to look back at them in some ways, you know, that very popular um, phrase nowadays of unintended consequences. Did we really know exactly what was going to happen when we laid out these ordinances? So, no, I don't have any specific changes for the ordinances now, but maybe it's just to say, OK, we've looked at them again. We've heard from the public. I understand them better now. They seem to be very adequate. You know, they, they, they still have our blessing. Um, but, you know, when it, in terms of that larger concept of infill, we're getting a lot of kickback from people in the neighborhoods, for sure. Um, there were, that was all due to an ordinance that was passed a while ago. Um, I've talked to counselors who think, well, maybe we should look at that again. Um, some things have happened that they hadn't thought about in terms of uh, the impact of those ordinances, um, the very small lot sizes, the very small um, unit sizes, things of that nature. Um, I'm certainly not bowing to the pressure of people in the William Street area or the Bay State Village, um, but I also want to admit that sometimes we could have made mistakes in some areas. And uh, if we, as a planning board, we can only evaluate projects on the ordinances that we have. And I want to make sure that we're evaluating things on ordinances that can still stand on their own two feet. Um, so, Carolyn, I'm not I'm not at all kind of trying to put you in a defensive position because you've been like the heart and the soul of a lot of these ordinances. Um, 
but I just want to respect that, you know, times, times have changed in the past 20, 10, 20 years since I've started on the planning board and the ideas and concepts about some of these larger issues change too. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, on to that point, actually, um, we've been talking for many years about amending the lighting ordinance. So starting there, let's just say, um, and uh, I started on the path of uh, one of the issues was that we just didn't have the technology back in, gosh, I want to say 2007 when this was updated. And um, then, so when we started thinking about updating it in 2015, 2016, um, the technology has changed even since then. Um, I actually have just this um, February pulled off the back burner an amendment to the lighting ordinance that takes in a lot of the comments that, you know, James Lowenthal came to the planning board a couple pre COVID with a presentation about the impacts of light and the planning board started evaluating permits a little bit differently, even though the ordinance wasn't there, still in implementing some of the recommendations that um, James had um, identified as, as being sort of the next step. So I have been floating this draft around with a um, prior building commissioner because he was very involved in lighting analysis right. and he understands right. the technology. And so he's given me feedback. This is a complete rewrite of the ordinance. Um, I was doing one more fine tuned tweak before sending it to the Energy Commission and before making it live. So that's actually in the works. So it right. might make more sense to sort of think about any kind of a discussion um, about lighting with sort of a bigger public body till after we get this rolling. Um, I, in fact, in an earlier draft, I James Lowenthal looked at and he gave me some feedback some of the recommendations he made, I did not incorporate because they were really more academic analysis and putting um, standards in place that really are not in the industry. They're really more of a, I think, an, an evaluation from an academic standpoint. Um, and the idea is to make this a simpler, straightforward ordinance, but that's updated with current understanding as well as current technology. And of course, the technology is going to be continuously changing, I assume. Um, but this is a, a start. So I actually was hoping to get something in front of council before the end of the fiscal year. I don't know if that's still going to happen, but we can try. Um, I do also want to, and similarly, Rich Parcelletti and I have been talking about modifications to the tree ordinance. So again, just to um, to emphasize that the Urban Forestry Commission works on public shade trees. Um, what we're talking about are trees on private property. And um, the, the tree ordinance to date has been very good, I would say, at making people um, think before they just go in and clear a site or think about clearing a site. So that knowing that the, the consequences are that they have to do tree replacement. So, um, Rich and I have been talking about ways to uh, maybe reducing the, um, the size of the tree that's considered that needs to be that's considered to be significant and therefore needs to be replaced. Um, I will also say that, as you said, there are some really strong opinions in some of these groups, um, including the lighting folks as well as the tree folks. Yep. And I have to say that some of them are very, very narrowly focused. And we, and no matter what kind of conversation we have, it's always important to think about where we're talking about these trees and <clears throat> focusing on saving one tree in an urban context um, doesn't also address the fact that, um, you know, we're preventing development from happening out in more suburban area where stands of trees might need to be removed and that the removal of those stands of trees is much more detrimental to the overall community effect of tree canopy. Um, and that, you know, the whole, I mean, 
so the context of urban versus suburban development, I mean, we need to look at the whole picture and not just, are we saving a Norway spruce on a particular property because someone in the neighborhood loves that tree? And, what, and also the fact that, you know, relating to open space, we have to look at the context of the neighborhood and know that, you know, there are thousands of acres of farmland within a block of certain properties downtown. And so we're protecting those soils and there's carbon sequestration in, you know, lots of areas around these other sites. And so um, I think any conversation the planning board might have with some of these groups, um, should also be in the context of the bigger picture because that's what the planning board is charged with doing is looking at the whole community and not just site by site tree by tree um and and i know this conversation is going to be happening in front of city council as well but wayne and i have had this conversation about the term open space and that maybe we should have just eradicated that a long time ago because okay. We're not right. We're not talking about permanently protected conservation areas when we talk about individual lot open space. It's really about impervious versus pervious coverage, and keeping you know some green on a site. Um, and you know, seven years ago, we there was this whole conversation about density, and um, so at that point, the threshold for um, creation of seven units was the point at which then maybe we'd want to think about what that open space means, that term open space on a particular lot. And so there are specific targeted requirements that formalize sort of usable space on a property is required once you hit that threshold of seven units or more, then the applicant needs to think about, well, I'm not just keeping strings of impervious area around the outside of the property, I'm actually creating a pocket park for the residents who live on that property so that it's more of an intentional space. Um, and so that conversation yep. was held. And so I think I, I'm not, I know that um, lots of people weren't part of that conversation and, and forget about it and don't understand nope. that that's there too. So it's definitely not, I mean, it's definitely something that's been part of the discussion as we've gone along. I mean, I'll say I was surprised with that proposal. I forget what street it was on, but maybe it was the William Street one where I think there are eight very small units and then there are only seven parking spaces required. And I know that, you know, we want to get away from encouraging people to have cars or whatever. But I mean, I think if you just extrapolate that out, and if like every, you know, lot on that street did something similar, then all of a sudden there isn't enough on street parking to accommodate. I mean, I think you have to imagine that there's going to be at least one car per unit. Um, you know what I mean? So I thought that was kind of like a little bit of a gap in the that the on-site parking required didn't match with the number of units. It was, you know, they were taken off of square footage. So I thought that was a well, little it was one to one. They have eight, they had eight parking spaces for eight units. I thought it was only know... seven parking spaces. No, they had eight. Did they? Um okay. I'm fairly certain. But at any rate, you know, uh, you know, Sam raised this too, like he you know there may be times when um property rent tenants or owners have two cars but that and so they'll have to figure out what to do during a snow removal you know a snow emergency situation um and so that but we also have data showing that there are fewer cars per household in the urban residential C districts. So um, we don't want to necessarily create more parking spaces than you know is is needed. And if there are extra, you know, people just need to make would make that choice. Can I live here because I have two cars? What am I going to do with my second car? Um, I just think it's a way to maybe keep the lot from being over densified if 
you know, you still need, you still have those open space or lot coverage requirements. So if you have to have like the right number of parking spaces, and forgive me, I really thought it was seven for the eight units, which I thought was kind of odd, but yeah. maybe I'm completely wrong. But I don't think it would have stuck out. So, um, mm. you know, that way it would, it would keep the lot, the number of units on the lot constrained by the by the amount of parking you have to provide for those units. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the philosophical discussion. Are we trying to constrain units in a place where we're trying to encourage them? And if so, then sure, you could use parking as a proxy for minimizing the number of park of units. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that was that that project was a little nuts, wasn't it? It was like a 10,000 square foot parcel with eight units on it. I mean, that's that to me was a little oh, bit too dense. It, it violated the spirit of what we all thought of when we voted for that. You know, I don't well, think anyone thought that was happening. Well, I'm, I'm not. Because no, no one wanted, no one wants that next to them. But people want, I people don't. Know, don't that's true. People don't mind that kind of living. They're 800 square foot units, um, and they're still expensive, I know, but people are willing to live in those situations. Um, you know, there's, we'll I, was, I was just at a tenement house today on Michaelman Avenue where there's eight units, much bigger than that. And there's, you know, five to seven people in each unit. Um, and people have that sure. next to them on Michaelman Avenue behind the watering hole. Um, but I also just just to say, you know, um, and this is part of, of evaluating, um, I mean, every planning board member is going to have their own opinion about projects, but I want to be clear when the rules are identified for what site plan and what special permit, um, the planning board, there's not the planning board needs to is required to approve a project if it's site plan unless it's technically not meeting the requirements in the zoning and so despite whether personally people feel that they wouldn't want to live next to this the uh, evaluation has to be objective to make sure that the application is meeting the rules established and there's been a lot of discussion about where it makes sense to have this kind of density. And personally, people may feel that they don't like the zoning, but I don't think that, um, I think there was a lot of discussion about what made sense from a zoning perspective. So I think it's a hard leap to take to say that's not what people anticipated when the city council adopted the zoning. Because there are many wait, wait, um, types of uh, I, I properties guess, uh, like that. Uh, I, I really want to push back hard. I don't know anyone who wants an, a larger, like they bought a bunch of single family homes and suddenly right next door to them are eight units. I don't, I think most people would be okay with four, but eight is a lot. That is a massive change to your block a massive change. You have put your money in and that is not a normal change. That is dramatic. Yeah. And I, 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 and, I, and, I, and I push back incredibly hard on the notion that most people are okay with suddenly eight, uh, with eight units, potentially up to 16 new cars right on their block. I can't. I cannot imagine anyone that says, "Oh, I really want that." But, but Sam, again, we're we're assuming that each unit's going to have two adults, and each each uh, adult is going to have a car, and that's not my assumption, especially when you're living downtown like at, that. At four hundred twenty thousand dollars, that neighborhood already has any number of uh, multifamily homes. With lots of folks in yes, it. Yes, at multifamily homes, but not eight units on on a tiny lot. Well, yeah, so, there yeah, are some right down the, the street. <laughs> there are some right down the street, opposite the school. 
Um, and I don't think they have enough on-site parking because it's they've been grandfathered in. It's a very, very mixed neighborhood. So sure, people with single family homes aren't aren't crazy about it. But again, I'm I live in a neighborhood where there's um there's a lot of home, a lot of people in big buildings. Um yeah. Right, and well, it's it we will, we will agree to disagree and 100 okay. percent you know I'm okay. probably i probably violate i violated my the rules by by saying that i went against the 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 statute but um <laughs> i find that uh you know i live in the city because I, as a general rule people are polite and uh, and friendly, and that project seemed grossly unfriendly, and and not polite to a to a neighbor who potentially just spent half a million dollars on a home and sunk their whole thing to it, and then they find out there's eight units coming into it. That's that's just a dramatic change, and. Um, and I think that um, uh, that there's that there's going to be serious blowback. I mean, but, I just but, think that we are going to we're going to lose we're going to lose this infill thing because we aren't we aren't just saying yeah this is it's not normal to want to eat you eat more. Potentially, I guess in in some fictional world where only one person is living in a four hundred twenty thousand square foot house and they only have one car, because as we said in our meeting that with the the other day, like when there were three of us there, and I asked the question, how many how many people in this room had only one car? Well. No one actually only had one car. Everyone had two cars. And, you know, I just, I think that that's a more common thing, especially amongst home ownership. And, you know, I, I, I really question the data that says that people who, ha who are homeowners in this downtown area only have one car. I do not know those people. I'm one of them, Sam. Two adults. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, so I think, yeah, we haven't gotten to all those data metrics. You know, we haven't done that kind of inventory. Perhaps they have it at the tax assessor's office. They probably could do that and give us a color coded map of uh, car ownership. That would be a great thing to see. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't bring this up to kind of revisit all of our, our uh, applications that we permitted. Um, but I know many of you, I myself, sometimes think back on a hearing or think back on a project when I see it finally in concrete in front of me and I say, whoops, how did that happen? Um, I'm never smart enough the day of to question everything that, that I should kind of, kind of question and, and think through. Um, I, I have a kind of a process question. Um, I guess having gone through that project and heard so much public unhappiness about it like I I'm just kind of wondering how we are meant to respond to that in the way that we are evaluating the rules in front of us but also you know how how are we not meant to be incorporating the feedback that we're also getting at the time of the project being heard well I mean I would say that um It's just I hard for me. Members. I don't know. It's hard for me. I like deeply connect with people in this city. I love living here. I want them to feel heard. Um, I did not like the project for many reasons, which I think were included in our guiding bylaws and everything. But in addition to that, you know, it's really difficult to not be like, oh, this community is really upset and then like vote for something because you have a set of rules in front of you. 
I mean, yes, it takes a lot. I think the planning board members who've been members for several years have been through this in various neighborhoods and sort of have seen that this is the case almost no matter what the scale of the project and no matter where the neighborhood is. Um, and so on some level, I think um, hearing um, concerns, I mean, the point of the hearing is to understand concerns, but also to be able to filter what is something that can be mitigated and that is an issue that needs to be addressed, that's not meeting the standards and what is really just sort of an emotional reaction to change in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There were also, I think it's important to, to know too that there are neighborhoods where projects can go through and they're not organized social media gurus who have um, been able to tell everyone in the neighborhood to come to the meeting to blast the planning board. And so mm -hmm. in those neighborhoods, um, nobody shows up. Does that mean that everyone's in favor of the project or is it really sort of a similar evaluation? It's just in one neighborhood, people are very organized and the people who might support a project are intimidated from participating. I think the other piece that's important to understand and we've had this linked on our website is many times it's there's been study after study but particularly in Massachusetts that because we're required to notify homeowners property owners of mm. hearings it's property owners who are privileged to be property owners and come to the hearings and a lot of the people who need the project to be developed are not notified or don't participate because they feel intimidated and so um it's the job of the board to sort of understand and sort of think about the bigger context. And even though in the moment you're hearing a lot of pushback, it's important to say, I understand you're concerned about this traffic, but here are the facts about traffic in this neighborhood. Here are the facts about speeding. There's no speeding on William Street because there were already, you know, speed tables and speed bumps. And in fact, there's cars parked on William Street. So there's no way you can speed down William Street. But, um, and to also bring in the other pieces of data to say, well, look, there's all this open space. There's permanent protected conservation area in spitting distance from this property. You know, there are other trees being permanently protected um, on permanent conservation area that help with, you know, that address, um, um, carbon sequestration concerns. So, but it's never easy. And George okay. can tell you because he served on the board a long time ago and now. now. <laughs> so. I think it's important too that we remember, or this is maybe just my opinion, but overwhelmingly the people that show up to these meetings are the people who don't want it to happen. The people right. who don't care or the people who do are too busy to bother. So it is always the people, not always, I won't say always, mostly the people who don't want it to happen. Um, sometimes, as Carolyn said, they're very well organized. They're coming with an intent and they're pulling out every stop, tugging on every heartstring, and they're going, you know, making every argument. And they've talked about it ahead of time. And it is difficult, but it's, it's planned and it's i don't think it's necessarily a, a cross section of the neighborhood that they're representing I sometimes so it, it, it helps to keep that in mind when you're when you're getting sort of bombarded with all of this and thinking oh my god what are we doing you know yeah well, and i also say I, I, this is the first time that i I, I mean, I can think of like multiple projects where there was a, the, the neighbor, the neighborhood was against it and I didn't have a problem. Like it made sense in a balanced way. This was the first project that I just felt was not balanced. And I go back to that and I will die on that cross. It didn't feel balanced. It is what it is. It's the, you know, it's the law of the land. It 
to me, it did not seem like a balanced project. And, and that doesn't, and that project's done, we've all, we voted on it. So now it's about moving forward and making, making it a sustainable, a sustainable policy uh, and not one that is, um, uh, creates a bunch of antagonism in, in our community. Yeah. I mean, I mean, of all the things that I'd love to get away with is I'd love to get rid of, I'd love to never hear the phrase affordable housing ever again, oh, because amen. it's just not like the notion that somehow this eight as 800 square foot thing is creating affordable housing is just like, it's just not possible. As, as I said, also in this meet, meeting, like I think of in the world, like when I look at anything, I think of it relative to a piece of sheetrock or a piece of plywood, 32 square feet. And a piece of subfloor right now is at $100 of one, one board. Like it's just not, it's not, it's not a realistic thing. Sam, well, we're I, not the I, board I, that created that. That affordable. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm up I, from the I community. Oh, I would love to get rid of that phrase. Corinne, did you want to add something? Um, I guess I was just going to say, you know, how do we make these meetings more accessible and get all of the parties to the table is by like follow up to that conversation. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's hard for us to evaluate if we're not getting a full perspective. I, you know, I think part of our role is to represent neighborhoods. Um, that's why we tend to be a cross section. And I think the mayor looks for that when making appointments. Um, these kind of decisions just can happen just within a neighborhood context with input from folks like that. Um, there has to be a larger view of the city and the, and the goals of the city. Um, and I understand your angst when it comes to listening to folks about how it's really impacting their lives. But if, if we allowed the neighbors to kind of have veto power over, over development, Northampton would, would have been stuck back in, you know, a very different kind of development process a long time ago. Um, imagine what would happen in Bay State. Um, I lived up in Leeds and people put in a very big development up there. None of the neighbors wanted it. They wanted to keep that patch of woods. Um, Chris lives really close to it now and all those neighbors really get along well. So there's there's something about time too that takes away some of the, some of the pain, I think from uh, the neighbors and from members of the planning board when you see these projects evolve. Yeah, um, I think that's been a benefit to the, to the neighborhood up here. I mean, I, w I wasn't here when they when they put that cul-de-sac in, but now that it's here, it's, you know, I think it's been a great thing for the neighborhood. Yep, yep. Just as an, if this is a huge sidebar, but just so you know, for that project that George is referencing, we had um, the chair of the planning board at the time was a restaurateur downtown, um, owned the East Side Grill, and he got a bomb threat during that public hearing process. So you guys think it's bad now? <laughs> there have been other times that have been insane. Yeah. And now look at what's happened. I mean, like that neighborhood is there now. There are people who are, you know, participating in the community and whatever. So yes, it get, can be very crazy. flavoring on this grill, on this steak. <laughs> <laughs> so I will um, say, okay, so here's some way if you want to stop development, Sam, if you don't like it, snow storage. That's like the one thing we can do. That's what it was on William Street that I didn't like was they were saying, oh, we have eight parking spaces for the eight units, but if it snows, we'll just use one of the parking spaces for snow storage. So that's like, okay, well, you don't have eight spaces. You only have seven. I think that's what I was thinking. I, I, of, all, of all the things, I actually said this in our, in our little, when we got together with Carolyn, uh, but the I would love to see uh, when they show these beautiful renderings of, 
you know, everyone walking with their dog and laughing in the spring. I'd love to see a picture with like a foot of dirty snow. <laughs> you know, you know that that's that's what I want to see. <laughs> yeah. But dragging their dogs wearing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, 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 <laughs> So uh, I don't I, I don't want to keep people long here. So just concretely, Carolyn, thanks for bringing that up about the lighting standards and looking at those. And there might be a, a process moving forward for maybe updating some of the ordinances on that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the same thing with the tree standards. Um, and and I'd love to, I guess part of it is I'd, I I want to see where we have opportunities for this professional development as volunteer planning board members how can i learn more about you know the, the the lighting plans that chris knows a lot about or kind of tree canopies and carbon sequestration um i i i sometimes feel so inadequate when looking at those presentations and i know you do a great job in kind of making sure that the applicants um, are meeting all of our standards and meeting our ordinances. Um, and you really help us with uh, staff notes to give us those kind of guiding questions so we can look at. But I, I often feel like um, there's a lot of other people in the community who, who could help me understand um, the other side of that. The applicants are always trying to get as much as they can from a given plot of land or given community. There's no doubt about it. Chris knows it professionally. David knows it. It's, it's, our, it's our mission to kind of evaluate those plans and push back a little bit to make sure that the neighborhood and the community is getting you know, our fair deal too, because they have the experts behind them and we are a, a volunteers. Um, so the more I the more I learn about a lot of those little specialties, the better I can represent the different neighborhoods. Um, so I look forward to hearing more about the lighting ordinances and the tree ordinances. Well, and I would love to go up. Oh, sorry. Something, something we heard, and maybe it was William Street. I don't remember, but um, you know, the the neighbors felt like everything was already predetermined. And I think so. I think Carolyn, you do like a, such a great job vetting the project before it comes to us that I think to the to the outside world when they come as a public to these meetings it's like oh well they've already you know kind of everything's already set you know they're all within the standards that they're supposed to be and then we kind of you know I don't want to say rubber stamp it because we're you know we're evaluating it based on the uh the regulations but i think it probably looks like that to the public because you know you've you've already kind of gone through it with a fine tooth comb um i kind of feel sometimes as a as a planning board member there isn't that much for me to comment on it's like all we really get to talk about are trees and i'm not quite sure what else like everything's already predetermined so you know i can see from the public's perspective it's kind of like oh wait you know this is just going to happen already you know what i mean and i'm not yeah. I, i'm not yeah. saying i i think it's great that all that happens and i don't have any um you know comments on it further it's just but i actually heard that kind of said in in the meeting recently yeah. i was like oh yeah i could see that perception mm -hmm. yeah we're not privy to that first draft that the applicant brings to carolyn that shows perhaps 12 units or some monstrosity that they want to put in and maybe at another town they could but carol has been able to kind of push back and with the use of the ordinance and the regulations say no 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 this is really you've got to trim this you've got to add this you've got to do that we're we don't see all that kind of dialogue that happens yeah. Yeah, i don't know if we could we actually go back to you know you know that 30 percent that seemed for this property just seemed so, it, it just was hard to see. Um, is there a way of, um, in this case, like using this as an example of something that was just a, a, a project on the edge, um, is there a way of sort of 
having you go and look and say, you know, projects that have, uh, let's, uh, let's say 35% open space. I'm just throwing out that number. Those, that, that gets just, that can go right through, uh, but something at 30%, it's like pushing that envelope actually does have planning board approval or more is more subjective. It, or is well, that or is that opening up a can of worms that would yeah. be a mistake? I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. Worried. I mean, so, I think you know you have to have a you have to have a a cutoff point, right? So whatever that yeah, cutoff course, point yeah. is. But I think to your point, I think to I don't know if this helps, but absolutely, you know, they have a survey, uh, they have a survey of the property, they have an engineer working on the plans. They certainly. Um, we have the ability to say, you need to prove to us at the end of the day, when you're done with this project, give us a surveyed as built that shows us that you're meeting that 30% open space. Um, they don't have to do this, but I will say, um, the applicant doesn't want to have a dumpster and a dumpster pad. And he's willing to get rid of that. And I think he only put it there because the consultant said, hey, put a dumpster in. And there's no requirement that says you have to have a dumpster. And frankly, I don't know why, be it whatever, USA is going to drive down that driveway to get garbage, you know? So I think that um, that's one that the applicant may very well come back and have more open space because they may rethink how they're going to take care of, ref, you know, their garbage and that might open up some more area. I can't see but, having 16 of those bins on the street for a, you know, a lot with like 50 feet of frontage every Tuesday morning. It's like insane. Well, you wouldn't necessarily, I mean, they have common storage areas, right? So they could just have two big roller bins, you know, or whatever, three for recycling and they get taken out three big bins, get rolled out, whatever it is. I'm, there, are prob there are many ways to figure out the solution, but all I'm saying is I think they have some wiggle room. They heard what was going on uh, in terms of the concerns. Um, and so the project may end up being different. You approve the maximum. They may come back smaller, but at any rate, we can still demand that they prove to us that they're meeting the minimum zoning requirements, which are 30% open space. And I think I think I said this in a meeting, but if they could just give us like a nice color exhibit, you know, mm -hmm. put in green the areas and the square footage of each of those areas and then have a table on the side where you add all those areas up. Divide that yep. by a lot size, it should be, you know, it's a simple calculation. They've already done yep. it. Right. So just show it in a way that everyone can see it. Because yeah, that George, makes sense. I mean, all those areas are just like little five foot strips next to the uh, driveway, you know, it isn't, it isn't all conglomerated into a nice park. It's all these like little strips around the, around the edges, but I mean, that's what the requirements say to do. So that's what they do. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I, I actually not sure that, I mean, in a, in a real world sense, I'm not sure that a dumpster is not actually have, like, I, I can imagine like on a drawing that having garbage cans would make it so there's more open space, but in a real world sense, a a dumpster that doesn't move that only is in, that is only its space and not a bunch of garbage cans spread out. Um, I actually think we'll honestly have uh, there'll be there'll be more real space. Like, I mean, I have, I have a property in Holyoke where I have all these garbage cans and it's like, they honestly take up a massive amount of space than if I just had like one dumpster, which I can't have there. I mean, I wish I sort of wish I could, it, it'd have its own thoughts, but. Um. Okie doke. Um, so Carolyn, once more and on modification to the tree, kind of uh, the tree standards, that would happen again 
uh, through conversations with that urban tree commission around public trees. Um, but then we have uh, certain ordinances just around our, our tree mitigation, our, what do we call it? Our a significant tree, tree. Uh -huh, and our significant trees. Um, so any changes to that might happen in some kind of public forum. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the thing that, that the Urban Forestry Commission has been pushing and rich to look at, to sort of stepping outside their jurisdiction and into the private realm. Um, but it comes with trade-offs, right? It makes development much more expensive, but we've yep. looked sure. at dividing, we've actually looked at a strategy of saying, okay, maybe we want to reduce the tree size that's considered significant um, for the suburban districts, anything that's SRRR WSP, but in town, we keep it at 20 or reduce it less. Uh -huh. So that then we're uh -huh. really saying, you know, there's a difference because when you take a smaller tree out in a grove of trees out on Ryan Road, that's going to have a much bigger impact on the community in terms of um, reducing the capacity for carbon sequestration than, it, than, you know, a bigger tree in town. So we're looking at that evaluation and really sort of trying to figure out what makes sense. And um, I think he, so that's probably going to come forward. It's just one of those things that, you know, it's in, Rich and I have been working on it, but it's, he's the one that wants to um, put all the math together and sort of look at um, what the benefits and the costs are to it. And um, so Great. we're Great. on, we've been working on that together. You know. And uh, Chris, would you be able to lead us on a little lighting adventure or Carolyn? I know that our, our old building inspector was very intent on Kind of light levels. I don't. I'm not sure about the new building inspector, um, but it, if other planning board members were interested, now it's getting staying lighter and lighter out. So it might be going out at ten o'clock at night or something. But maybe we could do it after dinner, um, after pizza. Um, but I would love to do that. Go to two or three different spots and look at a light meter and see what twelve point seven means and seven point five in different locations. Um, I think Do that you would have make access to a light meter. I don't know that I have one currently. The building department has one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think it's the other thing to really look at when you're driving around at night is just the the temperature of the light that really makes a big difference. I don't know how they did it, but the convenient the liquor store here in Leeds at on the bend. Oh, where, it's like what happened there? Did they even go through any kind of approval it, process because they just have these like bright white floodlights which are not blinding coming down from Haydenville into that corner all the building commissioner <laughs> it sounds like an enforcement issue yeah yeah okay all right well I don't mean well, to keep on you the record it's it's public record so I expect that you know <laughs> it'll get done <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you folks very much. I don't wanna keep us any longer on this short meeting, but those are just some issues I wanted to bring up. And I, I think, yeah, I think as volunteers, we, we definitely just need to kind of keep on top of things. And I need to keep learning about all these different technical and even non, even subjective things like Corinne was speaking about. So um, is that everything? There are no minutes, Carolyn? I did send minutes. <sighs> Um, you, so didn't, you didn't read them, George? Jesus. <laughs> right now. I, I read them right now. I move to approve the minutes. I will second okay. that motion. Can, it, can, anybody, can anybody give us a date for those minutes? No. April 14th. Thank you. April 14th. In a motion made to approve the minutes of April 14th, 2022. Um, seconded by Melissa. Yep. All right. Any discussion? Okay. Let's have a little voice vote. Krista? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Corinne? Yes. And uh, Sam? Yes. Okay. And unanimous.
Well, thank you very much, folks. So we're meeting again in two weeks, May 12th, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Carolyn says we have a full agenda. Yep. In person, right? In person, city okay. council chambers. Okay. I will not be able to make the next meeting, just an effort. Okay. Okay. Okie doke. Well, thanks, everybody. All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye.